Welcome back to the Canary Collective podcast. This is Kaylee Pruitham, and I'm so excited to be having a podcast episode with Steve Holly, who is the creator, um, one of the co-creators of the film, the documentary Damned to Extinction. We are going to talk about an issue that is so near and dear to my heart and is so, so crucial for anyone who's alive on this planet right now. Orca whales, orca whale health, salmon health, river health, justice for indigenous First Nations people, and the future of our planet. And a lot of you may know that we, I have a project trying to lobby members of Congress, convincing them to undam the Snake River so that we can restore orca populations. And that's what the film is about. So we're going to talk more about exactly how and why and what and where. So welcome, Steve. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. And you're zooming in from Hood River area? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, unseasonably warm, but uh, the skies are blue and there's a little breeze blowing, so I'm not going to complain. And you're a self, uh, you, self-titled self river rat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can tell you exactly how that happened. Um, one of my good friends in high school was a Matt and is still a massive fly fishing nerd and he was constantly uh his enthusiasm sort of spilled over into my world and and he started taking me down to i grew up on just the other side of mount hood in the portland area so we would go to the rivers around the portland area and uh before i knew it i was just kind of hooked wading in rivers and uh that's that's definitely shaped my life in ways that i couldn't have imagined when i was 15 or 16 years old so um, funny how those things happen i grew up on the columbia river so okay river rats connected to the salish sea yeah (laughs) well um i want to get more of the backstory of why you know how you got into this struggle and why you made the film but first i want to do a little exercise and um just uh say land acknowledgements that i am filming or zooming in from joshua tree california which is the land of the serrano chemehuevi and cahuila people and i i go by she her pronouns and this is um really important time to always center First Nations voices because this is about justice. Um, what, about, what about you and the area of Hood River? Uh, these, uh, the river here here was um, uh, the, and is the um, ancestral lands of the, I have a hard time pronouncing this just right, but it's the Kixt Wasco people and they fished the Columbia and had winter encampments just just down the hill from me here at a place called Middle Mountain. So I acknowledge their presence here and I'm, I'm grateful to be uh, um, speaking from their territory. Yes, and a lot of this um, struggle is being led by First Nations activists. The Lummi Nation is launching a project called Red Road to DC, where they're delivering a 400 year old cedar tree made totem that is going to be gifted to the Smithsonian and President Biden asking for sacred sites to be honored. And part of that is the rivers need to be undammed. Um, So let's imagine that the legislators and Biden and Governor Jay Inslee and Maria Cantwell and Patty Murray and maybe even Kathy McMorris Rogers, they were convinced. Their hearts were moved. They could not ignore the voices of the people and their conscience and the orcas singing them into justice. And they took action and policies drastically changed. And it was the story of the century. The headlines were glowing. Rivers are restored, orca and salmon populations soar. And now it's year 2040. 
it's so great to have you back on the podcast after 19 years. I can't believe we're living in the world we are now, thanks to efforts like your film and activism. How did we get here? I mean, what do you think were some of the main things that people did to get here? I think the most important thing is that people learned what was at stake and they had the courage to speak up for what was and is right. And a lot of times back then in the early 2020s, it was easy for people to believe that their individual actions would not make a difference. And I think what people learned over the in last 20 years is that an individual voice on its own may not make a difference, but in concert with even two or three or four others, that starts to build a movement. I'm glad so. that you said in concert too, because that is the style of activism of the orca whales too. They're singing together in community and using sound. And I, I think that every, all of those videos that streamed in of people, you know, taking videos of themselves out on the water and kayak with their daughters and um, taking pictures with the signs that with the beautiful art and then all of those letters that people mailed in with handwritten notes from seven year olds saying representative Mike Simpson in Idaho. Thank you so much for trying to stick your neck out as a Republican and save the salmon. I can't believe a seven year old wrote that. Yeah, <laughs> that, that made a difference. And your film made a difference. People have the courage to speak up because they were moved by the powerful storytelling. Yeah, and it's it's amazing looking at some of the uh, orca calves, the baby whales that were born in the early 2020s that are now you know, of reproductive age. And uh, they are, it, it was a tenuous future for them back in the early 2020s. And now uh, that they're of breeding age and apparently pretty healthy, um, I, you know, people's activism makes a difference in the world of, of, of marine biology, because here we are with, you know, growing Southern resident orca population in the year 2040. Feels pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it really was a turning point when Senator Patty Murray received that sweet letter from all of those third graders who they all drew pictures of the mother orca, was it Taliqua? Mm -hmm. Who carried her baby calf who had died for 17 days. And they drew pictures and told that story. And Patty Murray, who used to say she used to be a, a teacher or Head Start teacher, mm -hmm. I think that really tugged at her heart, heartstrings to remember that. And it felt heart like a priority to undam the rivers yeah she's retired in almost 90 years old now but you know she's i, I maybe she can start to conceive of what it's like to be a, a matriarch of the southern residents right she has that kind of experience now she's yeah. almost as old as granny j2 you know the the orca whale that died at over 100 years old so uh she deserves credit for being brave enough to take the lead on this issue back yeah. in back in 2021. Grandmotherly courage will save the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it will. So zooming back in time in our time machine, it's yeah. 2021 still. Yeah. And so what are even farther back? What were some of your do you have any encounter stories where you've um, <laughs> the whales, how, what inspired you to you. the film? When um, the film actually evolved out of a book I wrote called Recovering a Lost River. And that book has an unfortunate title that I picked. <laughs> but there's a chapter in that book about these whales. And um, I decided to include a chapter on the Southern residents after reading an article in a alt weekly newspaper in Seattle by a guy named David Nywert, who's uh, wrote of Orcas and Men, which is an excellent book. If you haven't yeah, I have. across it, you should get it. 
So this was David's article was in Seattle Weekly, I believe. And uh, I was just completely intrigued by what I read. And just on a whim, I called up Ken Balcom and said, hey, I'm writing a book about Snake River Dam removal. And this seems to um, be a timely topic. And he said, come on up. And um, uh, that was my first encounter with the whales. I saw them from a great distance from land, but I was still just totally enthralled. And, you know, I think for most people, unless you're lucky enough to be a marine biologist and out there taking pictures of these whales and, you know, you have a, a permit from NOAA to follow them around, I think for most people, this starts out being a people story. And for me, that was entirely true. Ken was the, my conduit to getting to know the whales. And, um, if you get a chance to go to the Center for Whale Research's website and look through their archive of photos, that's a great way to get to know the whales. But for me, it was also a great way to get to know a little bit some of the staff at the Center for Whale Research. And I remember, I think it was Dave Elifret who told me, I asked him, do the whales recognize Ken's boat? And he said, oh yeah. He said, they actually recognize Ken's face. Like they know who he is. And, you know, that in and of itself is a remarkable story. And I, as uh, Ken's good friend, Carl Safina put it once, you know, Ken is one of these scientists that's sort of lifting the curtain that separates us from the larger world. And if you're, you know, if you peek under that curtain and see what what's there, it's it's a fairly magical experience. And I think that's that's what Ken has done. It's such a rare treat to have somebody who spent 50 years studying one, you know, one creature. And uh, uh, I, he knows them as as well as any human could. Yes, it's it's really difficult to find a way to help people connect with animals that it's really great to leave them alone and you know, it's mm -hmm. a struggle but I'm so glad that you did make the film so that people can feel more vividly in multiple sensory ways how important it is to connect with what these whales really need because their health issues are yeah. Really dire and the the situation is getting a little bit better this year here. But what are what are some of the main points of um, concern for like what are the challenges that the whales are? Facing? Well, their biggest challenge is still and uh, and will be, you know, heading into the future, just a lack of their main source of food, which is spring summer chinook salmon in the Eastern Pacific. And that was the basis for these whales being listed under the Endangered Species Act back in 2006, I believe. Um, somebody may correct me on that date. It was either 2006 or eight. But, you know, they have other issues that are in common with um, marine mammals at the top of the food chain. You know, we have a legacy of toxic pollution in our water, including in our oceans. And, you know, there's a phenomenon called biomagnification where on the surface of it, you would think that a toxic substance would, uh, as it traveled up the food chain, might become more diffuse, like it might be diluted, but it actually, certain types of toxics actually concentrate in the fat layers of these marine mammals. And that definitely affects these orcas, but it's kind of a double indemnity for them because um, the, when they're hungry, they have to burn those fat layers, those toxic fat layers. And that it contributes to a host of maladies, including a, a lack of reproduc pre reproductive success. So, you know, it, it's it's um they have to eat that's that's the main thing they have to eat the larger problem with you know toxics in their toxic uh substances in their fat layers and their blubber 
unfortunately, I feel like that's going to be with us for the next generation or three, but it can be addressed if the whales are getting enough to eat. If they're not eating enough, that you know, they're going to be exposed to more of, of the nasty stuff that's concentrated in their fat. So that's, that's kind of the main sure. issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, it sounds really familiar in a way to what my body's going through and what a lot of my friends, my canary friends' bodies are going through with um, right. toxic liver, immunosuppression, and um, chronic Well, the heart. substances that travel up the food chain and, you know, are deposited in the fat layer of these animals are also, you know, we're exposed to a lot, lots of the same substances, PCBs, uh, that doesn't affect us. It doesn't affect <laughs> humans. Yeah, right. We're different. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's yeah. the interesting thing. I think that connects in a uh, intriguing way um, to the idea that we view ourselves as separate from the animal kingdom. And it, it's interesting if you, uh, again, this is something that Ken Balcom's friend, Carl Safina, pointed out in a talk that I heard him give, we've taken great pains to put ourselves above or separate from the animal kingdom. But the reality is if you take a, you know, a, a microscopic look at the nerve cells of a marine mammal and then put a human nerve cell under the same microscope, they're the same, you know? Uh, the old Cartesian idea that I think, therefore I am, is is uh, missing a few ingredients for you know uh, full existence. I think, and um, you know the the whole idea. My dog is right over here asleep in the heat, and um, you know the whole idea that she doesn't understand what our relationship. She understands it perfectly, you know. When I, when I say Maisie, hey, Maisie, come here, Maisie, <laughs> she's fast asleep. But you know, when she, most of the time, when she hears me call her name, she comes over and she's her tail's wagging and her eyes are bright. We both understand what that means. At that point, she and I don't live in separate worlds. So why would we, you know? go through all the trouble of deciding that the fate that we've created for these whales is different than the fate that we've created for ourselves. It's the same, same world, you know? Yes. I, I would love to share a little bit about my encounter story. Sure. I'd love to hear them. You're a documentary filmmaker. You know how to listen to people's stories. <laughs> yes, I do. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, ever since I was, well, I also, after I tell the story, I want to pick your brain about specifically just what would you say if you could convince, you know, a, a senator, if you had an elevator pitch for who was skeptical about, oh, should we really remove these dams? And just like, what are the convincing yeah. points? But I will share the human interest story first. Um, so I grew up in Seattle for the first five years of my life, and then my family moved to a farm in eastern Washington in Kathy McMorris Rogers' hometown of Kettle Falls, um, which is like five minutes away from the, the Roosevelt Lake Roosevelt, which is created because of um, the dams along the Columbia yeah. River. And um, I, I, when I was growing up in the Pacific Northwest, my best friend and I would watch Free Willy over and over and over and over again. And every time the scene <laughs> came up where the fishermen are, are capturing Willy, we would spit on the TV screen so that the, the screen would be covered in rainbow droplets of our spit. <laughs> and, um, and when I was five, probably because I was watching the movie so much, I started to have this dream. And I have continued to have this recurring dream about once a week or at least once a month ever since I was five years old and I'm 31 now. And so it goes like this. I am at Lime Kiln State Park. I am on the rocks in San Juan Island 
and I look out to shore and the whales start breaching and playing and I see them from shore and they come up to me and, and they start, we have conversation. And I look around and there are people witnessing this. And I say to the people, I have this dream all the time. And I explain, finally, this is happening in real life. <laughs> I always have this dream and then I, and, but now it's real life. And then I wake up and I'm like, oh, it didn't happen. It was a dream. <laughs> And then I'll have the dream again and I'll explain to people, I'll be like, now it's real life. Yeah. I always have this dream, but, but then I tell people that it's not a dream and then I wake up, but finally it's real life. <laughs> and I wake up <laughs> and it's gone on and on and on like that, where I, every time I think it's real life and I explain that I have that dream. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> like you need to, spend a couple of weeks at lime kiln this you know well, <laughs> i tried so the the story gets better i um when i was 25 the dream changed i moved to washington um i for throughout my life ever since i was young i would go to lime kiln and i would try i would imagine it happening and i'd be like okay this today this is going to be the time and they wouldn't show up and I kept on showing up. I would, I would bring certain people. I'd be like, I'm bringing my boyfriend and he's my true love. And they'll, now it'll be true. No, I'll bring my best friend from childhood and now they'll show up. No, um, I'll bring my sister. That's true love. Maybe they'll show up now. No. So when I was 25, I moved to Washington DC and I got this job um, training people on how to lobby members of Congress to convince them that climate change was happening in their home districts. And I was working for Friends Committee on National Legislation, and it was the week before the People's Climate March in New York in 2014. Um, my friend Sweetwater Nanook, who's an amazing Seattle First Nations activist who runs Idle No More Washington, she was flying in to DC for a lobby visit on the Arctic, and she asked to stay in my apartment with me. The night before she arrived, I had the dream, but it was different. I was in a canoe, and we could not see them. I was in the same spot, but they were not appearing. We had to go to a different part of the waters. And then they showed up and they, they said, you got a taste of what it's going to be like. It's going to be really hard to find us. You have to do something because we're not going to be here for very much longer. And I told Sweetwater when she arrived that I had that dream. And she said, oh, did you know that my grandfather is the chief of the killer whale clan in Alaska, the Nanook? tribe and she said people say that all the time when i come over to visit them they have that dream the night before i arrive oh. <laughs> she said my ancestors are the orca whales and they're speaking to you through dreams and so then she <laughs> we went to new york for the people's climate march just had amazing you know time and um, I was having some beginning of health issues and wanting to figure out what was going on. And she did a, a shamanic healing session on me and a healing crisis happened. And for lots of different reasons, I was in cheap housing. The water coming out was brown and moldy. I yeah. just tanked. There was a pesticide spray in my home. And all of a sudden I couldn't walk to the bathroom on my own. Couldn't keep my eyes open or sit upright for years. Um, for more than like a minute a day. And so I left my DC job and I finally, after four years of not being able to drive, I worked my way up one block at a time. I drove and I pushed my eyes to stay open then two blocks and three blocks. And I went to Lime Kiln by myself. I slept in my van, I drove and when I was driving to Anacortes to go to the ferry, I asked from my heart, I was like, okay, I'm gonna let go this. It doesn't have to happen, but if it's meant to, I'm just gonna speak from my heart. And I imagined my heart connecting to the orca whale's hearts. And I said, guide me to where you are, if you wanna rendezvous. And I asked some people like, where where do you think the orca whales might be? And they said, go to Washington Park. And so I went to Washington Park. What I thought was Washington Park, I would turn left. 
I tried to turn left and my arms turned the wheel right. And I was like, I've never been here before. Okay. And I turned right. I parked. I looked up to the water. <sighs> the orca whale dorsal fins were sticking out of the water. I ran. There was a, there were two men coming out in their little dinghy boat. And I said, I'll pay you $50 if you can take me out to the whales. And we, we rode and went, you know, kind of, of course, far away, but we were pretty close and swam and rode in the boat in the dinghy as they were swimming around. And I was like, finally it happened and it's not a dream. <laughs> then I woke up, just kidding. No. I didn't wake up. <laughs> it was real life. And then the next four days, I went to Lime Kiln and my, as soon as I parked, I opened the door and I hear, Wow. And they were right off the shore at Lime Kiln, just as my dream happened. And I brought my baritone ukulele and I said, if you can hear me, start breaching. And it, and they didn't. And I was like, okay, as soon as I start singing, breach. And I started singing and they started breaching. Yeah. The next day, I had a Celtic shamanic soul piece retrieval journey as soon as I arrived at that woman's house she said the whales just arrived they're outside the house in the water you must have good whale energy and afterwards I was like I would love to go rendezvous with the whales where should I go she said you should turn left out of the driveway I was gonna turn left but my arms turned me right and I met up with them four days in a row just having my steering wheel guide me and <laughs> wow. at the exact moment where they appeared off of shore. <laughs> There's, I mean, these are remarkable creatures. There's a, another documentary about a killer whale named Luna. Have you seen this? Yes. You know, um, just remarkable anecdotes of incredible animal intelligence. You know, and people, I was curious about what your emotional reaction was when this was happening, because one of the things I recall from that documentary is people would say that they felt like Luna could sort of look into their souls for lack of a you know more scientific term, I guess. And um, you definitely have that experience when you encounter these creatures, even from a fair distance, they're you know, we know that uh, I've heard several anecdotes of uh, orcas delivering uh, dogs that have fallen overboard to shore. <laughs> um, uh, there's a salmon activist in BC, and I'm a fool for not remembering her name right now. Uh, she's fought the open sea pen nets, and she also has a book out uh, right now called Not On My Watch, and I'll remember her name in just a second. But um, her husband, 40 years ago now, died in a scuba diving accident up in the Salish Sea. And that was a terrible day, obviously, but when, um, when the story is told, she talks about how, what happened is her husband's uh, breathing regulator malfunctioned. And, um, you know, normally he would come up every 10 minutes and check in and, and she would be on the boat. And she said on the day that this accident happened, the, the orcas were surfacing around her boat as if they were trying to tell her, hey, there's a problem here, you know. Wow. And she finally realized it had been too long since, you know, he had surfaced and she motored over and could see his body in the in the water but you know so she could she's she's seen that the you know whales seem to key in on what's going on with us humans there's also stories of ships you know out on the in the in the ocean and somebody dies on board and the orcas will gather around that ship they seem to have a sense for, you know, 
life, life and death, you know? And then there's yeah. the story, of course, that's in the film of Ken being led across the Harrow Strait through the fog by whales and the right. whales dropping him off, you know, in front of his house. So yes. we think we know stuff, but we don't know, <laughs> we don't know as um, much as the whales do. Especially um, like white colonizer, kind of Western scientific mind humans, mm -hmm. uh, that paradigm doesn't leave a lot of room for uh, the, the paradigms of the mysterious and the spirit spiritual realm. You know, I used to kind of poo poo these kinds of things like, oh, making fun of like, oh, I think I can connect with whales. You know, I, I yeah. wanted to stick to science and, um, but even in of orcas and men, you know, I think he describes um, scientists being able to communicate with a woman who in her dreams, like granny and orcas would come to her in dreams and say, this is our location, this, this is what's going on. And then the marine biologists were able to confirm, yes, that was their location. And, yeah. um, and so if th that could be poo-pooed, but also it might be a little bit of the internalized delegitimization of indigenous paradigms, you know? And, right. uh, you know, it's like we can step back and realize that we have a lot to learn and, and the ways that colonization in the last century has really not been working very well for very yeah. many people. The, the industries that we've been and the projects that we've been doing and the ways we've been using energy is not sustainable. So right. what if they are trying to communicate with us in dreams, what do you think they would want us to do? And if it includes <laughs> removing the dams, why? Well, I think ultimately the, you know, we got away with what we got away with when we built all these dams in the last century, mainly because the ocean was still a fertile, fecund, healthy ecosystem. But we were living on borrowed time because we have this little fossil fuel addiction. And what we're seeing right now, the reason that the situation has become so dire for the future of salmon and these whales is uh, the ocean, because of our fossil fuel habit, is acidifying, right? And that's affecting the food chain. The salmon feed on these little things called copepods. And the future of that sort of bottom of the food chain creature is very much in question because the ocean is the, the is uh, the chemistry of the ocean is changing as the as the and the obviously on the terrestrial ecosystems the temperature is getting warmer so you know salmon are being affected by those warmer temperatures and the dams make that part of their life cycle worse but it used to be if they got through you know, the dams and out to the ocean, there's just this rich pasture of food. That doesn't exist anymore. So salmon have this, again, you know, it's just the same way the whales have it, this kind of uh, double jeopardy. If they can make it out to the ocean, they're not finding the same level of food that they did 50 years ago. So the way that we can sort of ameliorate the, the double jeopardy is to take out the dams. And I guess, I think what the orcas are trying to tell us, and then, you know, on a, on a more, uh, I guess, practical level, what I'm trying to tell politicians is our energy future is changing. You know, California passed a renewable energy bill, start a series of them actually starting in the early uh, 21st century, they're ahead of schedule. They have built, uh, you know, a network of solar arrays, both rooftop and utility scale solar that exceeds the, you know, the capacity of the hydro system here in the Pacific Northwest. Battery technology is evolving it's going to be possible for us to not only talk about removing four dams on in Eastern Washington and on the lower Snake River, but as First Nations, you know, um, 
in particular the Yakima tribe and one of their leaders, a, a gentleman by the name of Joe Day Gowdy, he gave us talk on this subject uh, almost two years ago now about it's time to start planning for taking out all of these dams. And it's obviously not gonna happen tomorrow, but that I think is what these creatures are trying to tell us. It's, it's a simple tale of causing destruction, causing damage. And if you want the you know, portion of our lives that includes these whales to continue, we're gonna have to fix what we broke. And uh, it, the, the, the good news is you don't even need to, this is a completely irrational economic argument at this point. You can, if you are the, the kind of person that wants to be divorced from any uh, aesthetic or moral arguments about the necessity of wild places and things, that's fine. Because just on a strictly rational economic basis, there is no reason for all of these dams to exist anymore. And certainly not, you know, not only does climate change affect the well being of these wild creatures that we love, but it also affects the future of hydropower. If there's going to be less flow in rivers, there's going to be less electricity that these rivers can produce. And that they're, that system is not going to be as reliable as it has been in the past. So let's change it. The opportunity is here. And, um, you know, as the kind of third rail of that argument, of course, there are scintillating and inspiring reasons in the realm of eth ethics, aesthetics, and morals to keep these creatures with us. Because I, you know, as they go, so do we. So that's, 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 that's what I think the orcas are trying to tell us. And that's the message I'm trying to relay through them to the decision makers. And as you say, as they go, so do we, that pretty much embodies the spirit of the Canary Collective and what I'm trying to say with, you know, all of the living beings who are feeling the effects of the ecosystem imbalance and how these systems aren't working. We're feeling it in our bodies as warning signs. We are circling the ship and we are saying, hey, something yeah. is amiss or we're circling the boat. Um, and so let's pretend I am Republican Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers, who has been a staunch opponent of the movement to remove any dams. Right. So um, she comes from a very conservative um, community. I grew up in this town of 1500 people, um, wonderful people, people who are my best friends, we would go out on the lake on our boats together and have camping trips and they have tree nurseries and they care about irrigation and farming rights and they, they care about not being taxed um, because it's really already hard to afford healthcare and food out there. Yeah. So they have reasons to be really skeptical of large government spending um, and, and afraid of jobs being taken away. So, you know, Kathy McMorris Rogers must have some reasons why she is worried about this happening. So what do you, what do you have to say to me? I, I have two minutes, Steve. <laughs> well, Congressman, Congresswoman McMorris Rogers, how would you like to be uh, remembered as the Washington uh, member of Congress that trans transformed the region's energy system to meet 21st century needs. How would you like to be the Congresswoman remembered for changing the economy of Eastern Washington from one, you know, that's relied on government uh, programs for free water, free electricity, subsidized agriculture, and all of the, you know, uh, there are benefits to that system, but there are also some serious drawbacks. How would you like to be remembered as the Congresswoman that diversified that economy into uh, uh, one that changed our energy grid to meet 21st century needs? 
And then finally, I would say as a, I know you're a conservative Christian, how would you like to be remembered as a Congresswoman who protected God's green earth, brought back orcas and salmon? I know there are people in your community that have memories of what it was like to catch big fish on the Columbia and its tributaries. How would you like to have a legacy as the Congresswoman that brought all those things back, brought them home to Eastern Washington? Well, I would love to do that, Steve, but we do have um, programs that are that are trying to restore the salmon. So we, we don't, we already have a great economy. Um, Eastern Washington is robust and um, I cannot risk a bunch of jobs being lost and us losing that electricity. I would suggest that a lot of those jobs are going to change or disappear as the 21st century unfolds. We know, for instance, that the huge agro uh, economy around dryland farming, for instance, for lentils and wheat, is probably not going to last through the century because of changes in precipitation patterns. Um, is it really going to make sense to ship a low value crop like wheat halfway around the world in a new economy that's trying to get away from fossil fuels? Um, there are changes coming and rather than clinging to what you had in the past century, I think it's time to start looking forward to what is coming in this century. And there's going to be losses, but in those losses, there are also opportunities that I think now is the time to take advantage of those. Well, between you and me, Steve, I do care about salmon and orca whales, but I have to care about my constituents first. So as long as if I add my name of, of approval to the dam removal, I have to be in the news as saying that I stuck up for my constituents and made sure that they didn't lose their jobs or they got different jobs. So can you make sure that that's what the headlines will say? Because that proposal, I want to get elected. Congresswoman, that proposal is already on the table. You know it, you've read it. It comes from Mike Simpson in Idaho. He is as conservative, if not more so than you are. And he's proposed making sure that nobody comes out of this dam removal process broken. That's why he suggested the price tag for this is a, you know, north somewhere north of thirty billion dollars. That's to ensure that people whose jobs are uh, going to be transitioned out of the hydropower economy and into a, a, a solar alternative energy economy, solar and wind powered, and battery storage economy, that they have the means to make that transition. It's also going to help address some of the effects of climate change that we're already seeing in the farm economy of your district. So get with the program. No. <laughs> well, I do respect Mike Simpson and um, I'll, I'll have a meeting with him again and, and we'll see, but you've got to get your Democrats, your precious liberals on board because they rejected Mike Simpson's. Oh, yes, so I agree with you They're They drive me insane. What can we do about them? <laughs> yeah, that's the one thing we can agree on. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, you saw this last week in the paper, uh, in, the, in the Seattle Times, that this is straight out of a 19th century colonial playbook. Governor Inslee absolutely used the political capital of Washington's First Nations to get hit a climate bill to his desk. And when it arrived on his desk, he stripped out and vetoed all of the provisions that First Nations had negotiated into that bill to the point where Fawn Sharp called him a snake. And so I do think that there's a lot of soul searching to be done in the so-called progressive liberal Democrat wing of our regional politics right now, because based on evidence alone, if you look at how Inslee and Murray and Cantwell have reacted to this proposal, 
it's quite clear that they are perfectly content to let orcas and salmon go extinct right now. And we need to make sure that they hear that that is not an acceptable outcome. You know, the, I, it's perplexing to me why they wouldn't, I mean, can you think about this headline? And I guess this is sort of the less rosy version of what we envisioned at the beginning of this podcast. But th this is current and it actually has a basis in, in what's happening now. The largest infrastructure and environment uh, rest, environmental restoration project of the past half century in the Pacific Northwest was proposed by a conservative Republican from Idaho and was thwarted by a trio of liberal Democrats from Western Washington. That's weird. And we need to ask why that's happening and what we can do to change that scenario. It's, oh, you know, politics are these days are getting weirder and weirder. And this, this, if you would have asked me 10 years ago or when five years ago when we started making this movie, if I thought the savior of the cause of removing Snake River dams was going to be a Fox News watching <laughs> conservative uh, from a uh, congressman from Eastern Idaho, I, I probably wouldn't have taken that bet. But here we are. And then if you would have suggested further that it was going to be the Western Washington Democrats that blocked this proposal, I wouldn't have taken that bet either. But that's the reality we're up against right now. And so it really, to get back to the idea of sort of mobilization, even if you don't know what to say or who to say it to, if you care about this issue, the time to speak out is now. And it doesn't matter if your words aren't exactly uh, the most eloquent that you imagined yourself speaking, or if you're, you ran out of your favorite stationery, or <laughs> you had to compromise and send an email instead of crafting that perfect personal letter that you wanted to. Do something now. Save the perfect thing for later, but do something now. This is so important right now if we're going to solve this crisis. So, yes, indeed. And I'm, well, and now I'm Kaylee. I'm not Representative McCross. Oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I agree that we need to be encouraging because it can be daunting. Um, not everyone can hold their own like you just did in that sample lobby visit. Um, and because we, we are busy, we are busy surviving a pandemic. We're busy taking care of our kids and ourselves and our health and trying to get through life. And it's just, of course, we're going to be overwhelmed and not have time to take action or write a letter or let alone do enough research to kind of get at the policy details of why, why we need, you know, these dams removed. But what I learned from being a lobbyist in DC is that it doesn't matter, like talking about the policy points as much, um, leave that to the nonprofits and the researchers and the scientists who are lobbying. What, what they need to hear is from a massive amount of people who are coming from many different directions, especially their constituents in their home districts in creative ways that people care just that people right. care and that this, this is an issue that is on people's radar, that is that they're making a decision about whether or not they're gonna reelect someone based on what they do in this moment of, in history. And so yes, do the next right thing, do the most accessible thing to you, even if that is just posting a video on t Twitter with the hashtag, it's about damn time and tagging at Jay Inslee or Gov Inslee or whatever mm -hmm. his hashtag is. Like they have um, at people who are hired, it's their job to look every day on social media and track, you know, when people are tagging them on Twitter and tallying what are the issues people are talking about. Oh, this is trending today. Mm -hmm. What's this hashtag about? Oh, we better look out for this. And if they're not getting that, because people are too afraid or too busy to even say anything 
or you're just posting your videos without tagging the actual member of Congress and you're not actually getting your stories to their inboxes and to their, you know, eyeballs if they are seeing, then they won't know how many people care about this. Right. So do right. something, something is better than nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. What, I mean, I'm sure there are endless parallels and analogies to be drawn, but between what your, your health challenges and what's happening with these whales. And I'm sure you've given this some thought before, but um, talk about, if you would, if you don't mind me asking you a question, uh, what are what are those resonances there between what you see these whales going through and you know the the fact that you're uh, living in the desert in Southern California instead of along the Columbia or back in D.C. as a lobbyist somewhere? I mean, you've kind of been a displaced person because of this, but uh, you know, nonetheless, you're leaving leading a productive, creative life here, but. Uh, the the condition of the world has presented you with some challenges. Uh, yes, it has. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I am living in Joshua Tree because I have environmental illness and immunosuppression from a series of complicated factors with my my body's ecosystems being out of whack and. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of labels to the illnesses that I have. One of them is myalgic encephalomyelitis or multiple chemical sensitivity, MCS, um, and chronic infections like, oh, it froze. Um, chronic right. infections like uh, liver issues. I just got blood test results back um, yesterday. Um, it's been six years since I really, really crashed in my health and my Epstein-Barr virus, which is like the mononucleosis um, kind of thing. I, I have like swollen lymph nodes, like rock hard in the back of my neck that have been flaring and, and this just bone crushing fatigue uh, that happens off and on. And most people say, oh, once you get mono when you're a teenager or whatever, like you're not going to get it again, but it'll be within you. But like your mm -hmm. immune system keeps that at bay. But not my immune system. It is just uh -huh. constantly been there and my body can't kick it. It can't get over it. And um, Epstein-Barr virus infected my liver and my spleen. And so my blood test results just showed that I'm in the early stages of liver cirrhosis, um, that I'm not going to have enough function of my liver. I have never been a drinker of alcohol, anything. Um, I also, my markers for Epstein-Barr virus are like in the thousands when like normal is like 70 or something um, for the IgG test. Uh -huh. And so I've been taking antiviral medicine. I've been, I've been doing artesanate IVs, antibiotics for months and months at a time, all kinds of treatments, vitamin C treatments, B vitamins, taking 50 pills a day. And if I don't take antiviral medication every day, then the swollen lymph nodes happen. I feel like I have the flu. Like, if, have mm -hmm. you ever had the flu where you have a hundred three temperature and you have the chills and yeah. you're, you're just feeling like, oh, every little sound and oh, the lights are so bright. That yeah. is that is how I have felt about ninety percent of my days for six years straight. Ugh. And I've gotten really good at pretending that I don't feel that. Um, for a couple years, I couldn't pretend that I didn't feel that it, it was no choice. It was very clear. I could not <laughs> really talk. My, my sore throat was so bad. Yeah. Um, but when I have compassion for myself and what my body's going through, when I look at the context of all of a sudden my, my body could not handle if someone walked in the room and they were wearing old spice deodorant, or if someone came in and sprayed Febreze, chemicals Ooh, yeah i don't like that either or if someone washed laundry in a laundry machine that had had fabric softeners even 10 washes previously my whole body breaks out in rashes my tongue swells gets bloody sores on it and i 
can't talk. So these chemicals, you know, my liver can't process petrochemicals. That's another part of our addiction to fossil fuels. And I have compassion for my body dealing with all these new elements that humans have brought into our daily lives since the 60s and 70s, 1960s and 70s, really. Pesticides in our food system and everything. And we're not acknowledging just how many autoimmune conditions. It's not just a genetic fluke. Right. It really is genetics plus environment. And more and more and more and more and more humans are out for the count. At age 25, I've started to meet so many people in, in my canary pod, so many people out there who have a similar story, similar symptoms to mine and the healthcare system. We've fallen through the cracks. And so compassion for my body means I have compassion for the animals who are feeling this, who don't have the ability to speak English and or whatever and say to the members of Congress and tell their stories. The only way that they have is coming up to the surface and carrying their baby for 17 days um, at the surface of the water. Their livers are struggling. Their immune systems are struggling. They're malnourished. They are feeling the ecosystem imbalance in their bodies and they can't think positive thoughts and go on a gluten-free diet <laughs> enough to like, yeah. you know, like to heal or like really yeah. go through some counseling to get rid of their emotional trauma, which is causing their immunosuppression, which I've done a lot of work on too. But like also it's really hard to get over polluted water and, and not getting enough nutrition. It's mm -hmm. just really hard to rise above that. Right. It's good. It, it, that's the connection to the orca issue. You're, yes, there are, there's toxic in your blubber, but the main problem is you're not getting enough to eat. And, you know, so it's like, um, I, there's just a host of new, uh, chemical compounds that we're being exposed to that we don't even have the slightest clue about how they're, it's interesting the way that a lot of these chemicals seem to come out in um, the endocrine system and affect re reproductive health, you know? Yes. And we're definitely seeing that with the whales. Um, seeing that with humans and that is a big part of my journey as well. Yeah. Yep. So, wow. Yeah, I, I feel it in my bones. Like this, this is a personal, personal issue to me. Yeah. And I cannot forget, I can't, I can't ignore what's going on, but it is very frustrating to know what I'm capable of because I used to be out in a business suit, traveling the country, giving workshops with my lively self and like bringing people into a member of Congress office and coaching them on how to write a creative, um, letter like handwritten letter and deliver it to them we had one time when um we there was a group of people who were trying to lobby a particular member of congress but you have to get through the legislative aids on that certain policy mm -hmm. first if you want to like talk to a senator usually and they were having trouble getting through this legislative aid in minnesota who was on like foreign policy they were trying to advocate for diplomacy rather than violence with negotiations with Iran yeah. and they just we we said okay let's look up this legislative aid and they found out that she is obsessed with cats and she's like had a cat um that she like takes to shows or something and it's like an award-winning okay. cat wow <laughs> yeah and the legislative aid mentioned that to her you know they saw the picture on her desk and so we sat down one evening before the next meeting and we created this card, this handwritten card where we took a picture of all the people in Minnesota together waving and friendly faces. And, and then we like cut out these pictures of, of cats and we like wrote in markers and everyone signed the card and they delivered it to her. And they said it completely changed the dynamic. The legislative aide was so touched. She put the card on her desk and they got a meeting with the senator. And like, it, it just really, I think, makes a difference to not, if we can push ourselves to be creative in the ways that we are talking about these issues. Yeah. So it's not just the heady, cerebral way of processing this, to feel in our bodies and our hearts and have it stand out. They get thousands of emails and petitions a day, but they might get one or two 
handwritten colorful cards in the mail that stand out in the piles that yeah. they'll frame and they certainly don't get very many thank you <laughs> letters. No. no they I think you even more so now than when you were working there you get the feeling of um offices that feel like they're under siege you know yeah and that's that produces its own kind of toxicity for sure uh, yeah and i you know watched frozen 2 which if, <laughs> if people out there with kids have seen it um i don't want to spoil it for you but so spoiler alert but basically the whole movie is the gist of it is that like in order to really have safety and healing for everyone, including like the people who were kind of the settlers in the area in this Norse fairy tale land and the land based, um, earth based, spirit based indigenous people. In order for anyone to have safety from all of the climate crises and the earthquakes and the electricity going out and the winds, and you know, the they were all getting malnourished, the food was drying up. Um, they had to go and make things right and justice had to be achieved by removing the dams which was stopping up the flow of um, what the indigenous people needed so i know it's disney and it's totally not like it's very problematic <laughs> well <laughs> like, i mean this the gist of the message is always you know the uh, well, the best kids literature and movies are speak to adults as well, right? It, it, yeah, it's over perhaps oversimplified, but that is, you know, the the drawback to talking too much about solar panels or alternative energy or batteries is that it doesn't address the core issues around consumption and sort of mindless, crass consumerism that got us into this pickle in the first place. So I always get really nervous when I hear some technophile talking about how people won't have to change or give anything up if we just embrace a renewable energy future, I don't see that as being entirely truthful, you know, yeah. um, on both a rational basis and then on a sort of spiritual metaphysical plane, we will have to change, you know, and that's, that's, that's the, that's kind of the hero's journey of the, of a kid's film like that. And, and of, you know, wisdom literature going back through the ages that circumstances are gonna dictate that you bail out of the nest and go find, you know, a brighter future. And that that's kind of what you're doing, you know, from your trailer down there and in Joshua Tree. I had to give up a lot of ideas of how my life was gonna go and I'm not running around in a business suit anymore but I'm still trying to do activism from my safe resting place and yeah with the limited limited energy that I do have so people can find ways forward yeah but, but um that's why you know with the the silly song idea that I had I, I just I wanted to my dream when I went to DC was I wanted to organize flash mobs in Congress. <laughs> I was, I was, where yeah. we would interrupt, you know, have sit-ins, but we would be singing, which is just a huge tool in most successful liberation yeah. movements. And so since we can't do that in person, I want to have a virtual choir. So just inviting everyone again, I've extended the deadline to submit videos, but if you do have time, even if you can't sing, um, I'm going to hopefully put together a virtual choir so people send in videos of them singing the remake to the song, let it go, but let it flow, let it flow. And just kind of having a fun out of the ordinary way of interacting with members of Congress to send yeah. the songs to them. And you can play an instrument, you can just dance along, you don't have to sing, um, but hold it or take a photo of yourself holding a sign that says breach Snake River dams um, with pictures of orca whales, just whatever you can, or send a letter and have, you know, when you take a picture of yourself holding that sign, post it on social media and tag your member of Congress and tag Governor Jay Inslee. Do you, um, do you know, uh, there's a folk singer up in the Salish Sea area who has printed signs um, 
and you can order them for like six bucks a pop. Uh, I'll connect you with him after the podcast. But um, he's he's made a career out of being sort of a uh, he's the Pacific Northwest's kind of uh, uh, folk singing activist. Um, and he's a great guy. I've actually met him up in Alaska on the uh, Arctic plane two summers ago when he was up there just trying to figure out ways to stop drilling in the Arctic, which I don't know if this is some bright news that shows that activism can pay off because um, Deb Holland, our new Secretary of the Interior, has halted drilling up there. That just happened yesterday. So, you know, uh, it, these things, Dana Lyons, that's this guy's name. Do you know Dana? You... Yes, I do. We, okay. we work together. Yeah. I'll connect you with Dana and he can probably get you some signs if you want them. That would be great. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. So on canarycollective.org forward slash activism, you can find ways to be involved with the Canary Choir and Orchestra. And <laughs> what, are, what are other um, organizations that you recommend people get involved with? And Damn to Extinction, your website has just a great resource list. Yeah, you know, I, I've joked about this in the past, but I, it may not be a funny joke, but it's one of those sayings that has a kernel of truth to it. I, I try not to give activist advice for the same reason I don't give dating advice. <laughs> you, know, it, um, you don't know the person well enough to maybe see what the match is. Um, there are lots of good organizations doing good work on this issue the most important thing though is for you to find your own voice and if if there's an organization that will help your voice resonate then by all means you know that list on our website is still valid um i i think the most important thing in terms of a political strategy that could happen for this campaign right now is there's a there's a lot of vocal a growing number of vocal people in idaho and there certainly is a growing number of vocal people in the Salish Sea. So we need people from like Stanley, Idaho to Friday Harbor on, out on the San Juan Islands to start connecting with one another. And I've been working with um, Idaho Conservation League and some other Idaho groups to try to figure out how to make this happen. This sort of watershed wide uh, messaging that people across a broad section of not only geography but culture and economy want to see this happen so uh that's 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 what we're up to and it, there's any number of good organizations that can you know amplify your voice so go uh go find them <laughs> My favorite locally here, their office is right in, right in downtown Hood River is Columbia Riverkeeper. Columbia yeah. Riverkeeper. Yep, so they're great. Yeah. Um, they do a lot of work on toxics as well. And so this is, I guess, kind of a logical extension of their campaign. And they've also fought back every major fossil fuel infrastructure project that was proposed, you know, in the, both Obama and Trump years, and they they're they're batting a thousand right now. We don't have any new. We have lots of oil trains, so I can't say that we're you know we've it's been a complete victory. But if you look at what the was proposed for the Columbia corridor back in you know 2008, it's remarkable how well activists have defended this part of the country from that kind of so-called development. So, uh, yeah. You know. Well, there, you know, the return of the river documentary about the Elwha River struggle was really inspiring, seeing that they were able to convince the committee, which was unanimously against removing the dams. Uh, then they flipped them to be unanimous, unanimously in favor of removing the dams. And they've yeah. just seen amazing, miraculous recovery of salmon populations just in a year, in the first year, they were yeah. surprised at, at what's possible to be healed. So it is possible to um, make this happen and and we will go with the flow and find the next right thing to do. But this this summer in particular, especially as 
the Lummi Nation delivers the uh, representatives del or deliver the totem to Washington D.C. Yes. this summer, and they'll be doing some lobbying. You say ab about till late August or September at least. So this mm -hmm. is the time. This is the time, though, this month, Orca Month, June, to be however you do it, making your voice heard, even if it just takes 15 seconds of doing something. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm going to be, uh, I haven't gotten around to recording your song yet, but I fully intend to. It's just been, it's a little, it's a little nutty. Uh, yeah, so I will, I will do that. And I'm also going to um, uh, put the Canary Collective up on Damn to Extinction's website so people can keep, oops, I'm going to not, why does it do that? Um, and uh, I really appreciate the, the connection between what's happening to human health and what's happening with the orcas. I think we can, um, you know, meditate on that, but also use it as a, a fuel for getting, getting these orcas what they need, which is a free flowing snake river. So yes, uh, thanks. Thanks for your activism and work on this issue for sure. Thank you so much for talking with me and thanks for doing what you're doing, Steve. I look forward to keeping in touch and seeing what we can do and then have that reunion podcast. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds good. And next spring, if you're still down there and it happens to rain a lot, I would love to come down and, uh, you know, a few times in my life, I've managed to see the, the desert uh, in Southern California bloom after a big rain. So, you know, yes. we'll keep our fingers crossed for that. Yes, we need that water flow. <laughs> yep. well thank you so much steve yeah thank you let's be in touch for sure yes sooner right. than 2040 <laughs> yes <laughs> definitely all right take care stay cool down there you too thanks bye